This great honor is especially meaningful to me because no one owes more to his research community than I do. And I feel the same spirit of family and community in the wonderful DePaul commitments to access to everyone and it takes a village to help all of us succeed in our dreams. When I asked about graduation speeches, I was told it is tradition to give advice and to be darn quick about it. But since we're all manifestly diverse, everyone needs somewhat different advice. And after all of these years, I'm still working on my own process, so I don't have any lofty pronouncements from my own experience. This is probably a relief. On the other hand, we are all the members of the same species, and part of what education with a capital E should mean is for us to gain some understanding and perspective on ourselves. So after acquiring a real education in college, shouldn't we be able to give the human race at least one piece of useful advice? What of many perspectives on humanity would you choose, and what advice would you give? There's a lot of scientific evidence that says our species has been on the planet for at least 200,000 years. And anthropologists who have studied thousands of societies around the world and found that all have language, stories, culture, religion, music, dance, art, several hundred categories of behaviors in all. A child born into one culture and moved at birth to another will grow up as a member of the receiving culture. We have to be very similar for this to be possible. So despite all of our manifest differences, down deep we are also very similar. And what seems to differ from culture to culture are not our categories, but how each culture fills them out. For example, we don't fight over whether we have beliefs about the world, but over what beliefs. So here's what strikes me about us. Even though for hundreds of thousands of years, we've cared so much about our beliefs to fight for them, until very recently, we humans have just taken the world of our senses and of our cultures as they seem, with almost no attempts to invent ways to check if our perceptions and beliefs actually hold water. In other words, we humans live inside of our heads to an astonishing degree, so much so that we resemble a creature in a dream that only occasionally matches up with the world it lives in. We live in a kind of a hallucination of our own devising. Francis Bacon pointed this out in 1610 when he called for methods to be developed to get around the blindnesses caused by our genetics, how our individual brains develop, how we use language, and how we assimilate the beliefs of our cultures. This was part of the already started invention of science, which produced example after example where careful investigations and new kinds of thinkings revealed that many of our beliefs about the world did not hold up. We have been fooling ourselves. So the perspective on humanity I would choose is that we are the species that fools itself. In fact, we even pay good money to be fooled. And we have been fooling ourselves for our entire 200,000 years. And part of the nature of this foolery is that we think we can see and that what we think is there is what is there. A wonderful line in the Talmud says, we think not as they are, but as we are. I've often wondered what happened to that person. Marshall McLuhan, the great Canadian philosopher, said, until I believe it, I can't see it. But we need dreams and imagination. One of my greatest heroes was Helen Keller, who was rendered blind and deaf 
before she was two years old, yet became the first deaf-blind person to earn a college degree at Radcliffe in 1904. In 1932, shortly after the Empire State Building was built, at the dawn of the Depression, in amazingly less than a year, as a statement by its contractors about what humans can do with purpose and will, Helen Keller, who knew a lot about purpose and will, took a trip to the top. She was asked afterwards by Dr. John Finley, what did you think of the site when you were on top of the Empire Building? Here are a few extracts from the letter she wrote to Finley. I quote, Frankly, I was so entranced seeing that I did not think about the sight. If there was a subconscious thought of it, it was in the nature of gratitude to God for having given the blind seeing minds. As I now recall the view I had from the Empire Tower, I'm convinced that until we have looked into darkness, we cannot know what a divine thing vision is. I will concede that my guide saw a thousand things that escaped me from the top of the Empire Building. But I am not envious, for imagination creates distances and horizons that reach to the end of the world. It is as easy for the mind to think in stars as in cobblestones. It was a thrilling experience to be whizzed in a lift a quarter of a mile heavenward and to see New York spread out like a marvelous tapestry beneath us. There was the Hudson, more like the flash of a sword blade than a noble river. The little island of Manhattan, set like a jewel in its nest of rainbow waters, stared up into my face and the solar system circled about my head. Why, I thought, the sun and stars are suburbs of New York and I never knew it. I see in the Empire State Building something else, passionate skill, arduous and fearless idealism. The tallest building is a victory of imagination. Instead of crouching close to the earth like a beast, the spirit of man soars to higher regions and from this new point of vantage, he looks upon the impossible with fortified courage and dreams yet more significant enterprises. What did I see and hear from the Empire Tower? As I stood there twinks to earth and sky, I saw a romantic structure wrought by human brains and hands that is to the burning eye of the sun a rival luminary. I saw it stand erect and serene in the midst of storm, and the tumult of elemental commotion. I heard the hammer of Thor ring when the shaft began to rise upward. I saw the unconquerable steel, the flash of testing flames, the sword-like rivets. I heard the stream, steam drills and pandemonium. I saw countless skilled workers welding together that mighty symmetry. I looked upon the marvel of frail yet indomitable hands that lifted the tower to its dominating height. When I first read that, I said, wow. I say it now. Every human being is born with the potential to learn to see, as Helen Keller learned to see, with their hearts, bodies, spirits, and minds, and to learn to be as vividly alive and human as Helen Keller learned to be. Our great gift is that though we are the stuff that dreams are made of, we can invest those dreams with the clearer knowledge brought by careful study beyond our simple prejudices. There is nothing more powerful than imagination coupled with investigation. Imagination allows us to dream and conceive of better futures for us all. Investigation finds the powers and knowledge to make better futures happen. So I think my advice to our species would be, we can't learn to see until we admit we are blind. In other words, let us learn how to wake up from the slumbers of our nervous system, culture, and beliefs, try to find out what is going on and what is really needed. Thank you.